Now, we all do know that once you've had a compromise in the rexis, that is, if the rexis runs off to the periphery, you now no longer have a stable capsular bag to withstand the forces of phacoemulsification. And any steps that take place thereafter come with a risk of the rexis tear extending into the posterior capsule. So perhaps, when faced with a scenario like this, the safest bet perhaps is to create one or two more relaxing incisions to convert to a manual SICS and thereby complete the surgery. I'd like to now share all the strategies and the techniques that one could use to be able to achieve a safe end outcome by performing phacoemulsification in an eye where there has been a rexus runoff to the periphery. Let's now move to the surgery. Typically in a patient with an intermissin cataract, I perform a small capsular rexis, decompress the capsular bag, and then proceed to completing the rexis. In this case, whilst performing the smaller inner rexis, my rexis, as you can see, has extended to the periphery in the six o'clock position. So what are my options here? Either I enlarge this capsulotomy by making multiple more cuts in the anterior capsule and convert to a manual SICS, but what I decided to do is try and enlarge the rexis and attempt to perform a phacoemulsification. Let's now see how we managed this case. The first step is to enlarge the capsulotomy. After fixating the eye, with the help of a cystodome, I make a tangential cut in the anterior capsule. I hold on to the tear thus created with the help of an intraocular forceps and I attempt to enlarge the capsulotomy as demonstrated. In a similar manner, I further enlarge the capsulotomy between the 6 and the 9 o'clock position. As you can see, the opening in the anterior capsule is now adequately large. After releasing some of the cohesive viscoelastic which was used for the rexis out of the eye, I perform a very gentle hydrodissection. I'm now ready to perform the nucleus management. Viscoelastic is introduced into the eye and then the phaco probe is introduced followed by the introduction of a short sharp chopper. The technique that I will use is that of a direct vertical chop. I impale the nucleus and I attempt the first chop that would divide the nucleus. It doesn't happen. I'm going to be careful to not perform an excessive lateral separation that could compromise my tear in the anterior capsule. At all times, I'm going to be mindful and see how easily my nucleus rotates. As long as it rotates easily, I'm sure that I've not created any compromise in the capsular bag. Note how in a controlled, slow manner, I proceed to downsize the nucleus by creating multiple chops. As you can see, this is an intermittent soft cataract. It's not a very hard cataract. Should it have been a hard cataract, I would most certainly have converted this to a manual SICS because the intraocular manipulations in dealing with a hard cataract with the torn anterior capsule have a much increased likelihood of the propagation of the tear in the anterior capsule to extend posteriorly and to compromise the posterior capsule. And now we perhaps get to one of the most important steps whilst performing a phacoemulsification in an eye with a compromised anterior capsule. And that is the step of the viscofluid exchange. It is extremely important to always remember that whenever you are getting the source of irrigation, that is either the phaco probe or the irrigation of the irrigation aspiration out of the eye, there is always a chance of shallowing of the anterior chamber. In order to avoid that from happening, because we do understand that if the chamber shallowed, the tear in the anterior capsule could extend up to the equator and then compromise the posterior capsule. So the way in which we can avoid that is by always performing a viscofluid exchange prior to the removal of the source of the irrigation, which in this case is the phaco probe from the eye.
It is also important to note that I work with low flow settings, that is, a power of about 30%, a flow rate of 26 to 28 cc per minute, and a vacuum of 200 millimeters of mercury. This is extremely important because in a case like this with a compromise in the anterior capsule, you want things to happen in a slow, controlled fashion. Let's now watch how we complete the nucleus emulsification in this case. The fragments are emulsified turn by turn. The last fragment is now impaled, but you can see it's quite a large fragment. It is downsized on its way up and then emulsified successfully. At the end of the nucleus emulsification, watch how I now perform a viscofluid exchange prior to the removal of the phaco probe from the eye. I then visualize under a higher magnification and I'm happy to see that there is no extension of the tear into the posterior capsule. I then proceed to performing a very careful bimanual irrigation aspiration to remove the cortex. Note how I perform a viscofluid exchange prior to swapping hands to complete the bimanual irrigation aspiration. At the end of the irrigation aspiration, once more I perform a viscofluid exchange. I'd like to now repeat that performing a viscofluid exchange is perhaps the most important step in a case with a compromised anterior capsule. In view of the fact that I have a torn anterior capsule, I took a decision to now implant a three-piece IOL for which a 3.2 mm keratome is taken and the incision is enlarged to almost a 3.6 or a 3.75 mm incision. We now proceed to watching the insertion of the 3-piece IOL. Once loaded, the orientation of the leading haptic is carefully noted as it advances towards the tip. In this part of the IOL insertion, watch how the second instrument guides the leading haptic into the ciliary sulcus. At this point, I'd like to add another valuable insight. In order to enhance the ease of introduction of the leading eyelid into the ciliary sulcus, you could actually enlarge the incision even further and introduce the tip of the cartridge way into the anterior chamber, almost close to the inferior pupillary edge. This would make this step a lot easier. I then reintroduce some more viscoelastic into the anterior chamber, another important step prior to the introduction of a ball dialer, which then hitches onto the trailing optic haptic junction, and you will see how finally it helps negotiate the trailing haptic into the ciliary sulcus. This is what you'll see in this part of the video. We have now successfully completed the implantation of the 3 p IOL in the ciliary sulcus. I now use a Y-shaped hook to retract the iris to confirm the position of the 3 p IOL. I then proceed to removing the excessive viscoelastic from the anterior chamber. It is important to avoid any rocking movements of the IOL in this case because even at this stage, it is possible to compromise the anterior capsule. So a very gentle removal of all the viscoelastic from the anterior chamber is performed. And finally, we get to the stromal hydration, which now brings us to the end of this surgery. And this is the end result, a stable 3 p IUL in the ciliary sulcus, a failure of extension of the anterior capsular tear into the posterior capsule, thereby avoiding 
any compromise of the posterior capsule and therefore an uneventful end result. I'd like to conclude this discussion with this. Care and caution needs to be taken into consideration while even deciding what should be the technique that we should use when we have a compromise at any step during the phaco emulsification procedure. Be safe and if you think that converting to a manual SICS is the best bet in a case like this, by all means, go ahead and do so. Even though I've managed to get away with phaco emulsification in this case, it comes after years of practicing phaco emulsification. I hope you found this video tutorial useful. Thank you.